Hi everyone, this is section eight of 910 by Nora Raleigh Baskin. And today we are joining Sergio in Brooklyn, New York. It is 12, 10 p.m. on September 10th. Uh, if you recall in the last section with Sergio, he had just jumped over a subway turnstile. He should have been in school, but instead he cut class because of this argument or situation he had with his father, Paul, at home. Uh, and so while he was walking down the streets, he thought he saw his principal and ducked into the subway system to escape. Unfortunately, that Metro card of his did not have any money on it. And so he ended up jumping over the turnstile to get onto the subway. And when last we left him, he had just gotten caught. So let's see how this plays out. What are you talking about? I swiped my card, Sergio said. He twisted his body and tried to yank himself out of the officer's grip, which loosened but didn't let go. There was rage lingering on the surface that rippled like a wave awakened into motion. Ooh, look at that rage, like a wave awakened into motion. So that's a comparison, comparing the feeling of rage to a wave. So what do we call that? Because it uses that keyword like, we have a simile. I watched you jump the turnstile, son. Son? I'm not your son. Let go of me. The man let go as if daring Sergio to run. But Sergio knew better than to run. You didn't run. You had to give the cop your name. You had to cooperate. You had to give in, give up. Answer to those who served and protected a world that had never served nor protected him. They were allowed to stop you for no reason. They could throw you up against the wall and pat you down, say whatever they wanted. And if you resisted, if you said one single thing, moved the wrong way, answered back, they could haul you in and that would be the end of that. That was the law. So what Sergio is specifically referencing right here is a law that does not exist anymore in New York City, but at the time it did, it was called stop and frisk. And this law was very controversial. The mayor at the time was a man named Michael Bloomberg, and he had approved this law. And what the law allowed was for police officers to stop and search anybody without what they call probable cause. So they didn't have to have a reason for searching you. They could stop you at any point. You could be walking down a street with your family, going to see a Broadway show, and the police could come up and say, I need to search you. And you had to stop, give your name, and allow them to search you. So obviously this was problematic because it takes away some of your own civil rights. And uh, when this reached the Supreme Court, it was overturned as being unconstitutional. But at the time of this story, stop and frisk was still going on, and it had not yet reached the Supreme Court. So it's important to note that Sergio was aware of this law, and he knew he had to give his name, he had to cooperate, he had to give up, he had to give in, and he had to obey, right? They could do this whole search procedure and say whatever they wanted. And if you resisted, they could arrest you. So he was aware of that law. And it seems like he was really frightened by it. OK, let's continue. Stop anyone like every black kid walking or running. Forget it. Down the street in his own neighborhood, down in the subway. The police were allowed to do what they wanted. Tease, taunt, humiliate, shove, prod, poke. Sergio's cousin Ralph had spouted tears that time the cops had grabbed him and ran their hands all over his legs, around his chest, up and down his arms, holding his head down so he couldn't look up, so he couldn't turn, see anything but the dark smothering of his own hoodie. Heavy, angry hands all over his body, loud, angry voices, robbing him of his being, of being a human being. Are you going to wet your pants, little boy? One of the cops said. Want me to call your Grammy for you? Ralph was huge, dark-skinned, with short dreads. He looked 16, but was only 11, and he cried like a baby. No, Sergio was not going to cry. He was not going to bend, not going to break. 
So this is important to note. This situation right here, remember last time we read, we said that a thing called a flashback gives us an idea about a character based on their past. Well, in Sergio's flashback, this is actually about his cousin, Ralph. His cousin looked 16. This is so important, but he was only 11. And he had gotten stopped and frisked by the police. And so this situation colors the way that Sergio looks at the police. So for me personally, my father was a police officer and having been a police officer, you know, it, it would break his heart to know stories like this because this is not what good police officers do. But nevertheless, this situation did happen to Sergio's cousin. And because of it, Sergio does not like or trust the police at this point. So we're going to have to see how this plays out because it seems like Sergio already is expecting for this situation to go badly. Where are you going so badly you need to steal a ride? What's it to you? Sergio answered. I dare you. I just dare you. So here we see Sergio's thoughts, and he's got that rage from that argument with Paul, and he's not thinking clearly. Look, I'm not a police officer. I'm not going to give you a ticket. Sergio lifted his eyes from the concrete platform. What the? Engine 209, ladder company 10. Sorry, kid. I was just... He should have noticed the man wasn't wearing a vest. The guy was just jacked, broad-chested, with strong brown-skinned arms. He wasn't a cop. He couldn't do anything. He was just a fireman. I just thought, I just wondered why you weren't in school. I have a nephew your age. It's Monday. The fireman laughed. But a good day to play hooky, I suppose. Hey, look, that's what I'm doing. Sergio leaned in and looked for the next train. The tunnel was dark. I'm not skipping school. My school has the day off. Sergio straightened himself up and answered where there was no question. They stood in silence for a long while. Well, technically, you know, I'm not either. The fireman seemed to feel the need to explain. I swapped days with a guy in my company, and you wouldn't believe why. The roar of the distant train whooshed into the station. A tiny light grew closer. Sergio had absolutely no interest in this guy and why he had the day off. But the unsettling sense of his authority lingered, as well a kind of yearning for it to play out at the same time. Okay, I'll play. Why? The fireman smiled. It's the guy's anniversary tomorrow, and he wants to surprise his wife. Take the day off, you know? So he's working my shift now, and I'll work his tomorrow. No big deal. But that's a nice story, right? Want to tell me yours? No. So this is interesting. There was no police officer on that platform. Instead, what we've got is a fireman. A fireman who has taken the day off today and has agreed to work tomorrow like it's no big deal. Tomorrow is 9-11. That's kind of sad and interesting. So we can almost predict what will happen to this, police, this uh, firefighter. But in the meantime, let's watch how he interacts with Sergio. We see that he comes clean as soon as he can. I'm not a police officer. I'm not going to give you a ticket. Okay. We see that he wasn't wearing a vest. So it's not like he looked like a police officer. Okay. So Sergio kind of, I don't know is angry at himself for not noticing earlier that this wasn't a police officer. It was really just this strong built African-American man who was standing there talking to him. Right. And then he kind of ignores him. Right. Sergio leans in, looks for the next train. He wants this guy to leave him alone. He wants this guy to go away, but the guy doesn't go away. Instead, the guy tries to engage him in conversation. He wants to talk to him. And it seems like it's really just out of the goodness of his heart. If you look at the reasoning behind it, he says, I have a nephew your age. So he's looking at Sergio and saying, wow, you know, if that was my nephew 
who had skipped school and was standing out on the subway platform and did something illegal, I'd want somebody to stop him. So whoever this firefighter is, it seems like he's got a pretty good heart. Let's continue. Sergio shook his head, and when the train stopped and the doors opened, he got in. The fireman, too. The doors hissed closed, and the train lurched forward. The car was mostly empty. Across from him sat an old lady with a grocery cart folded and leaning against her legs. If Sergio didn't know better, it might have been Mrs. Peterson from his building, but this lady was Chinese. There was a white man in a business suit and tie playing with some little device in his hands, one of those palm pilot things, tapping the screen with a skinny pen. So this is an old tech alert for you. Palm Pilot is something that no longer exists because we don't need it. It was the earliest version of the smartphone and the skinny pen was an early ver version of a stylus. So um, stuff that you know, you're know you used to as pretty common place back in 2001, really only the super rich had these things. And so for Sergio to see this guy playing with it, he knew that this guy was some kind of wealthy businessman. The subway hummed along, rocking rhythmically, like the washers in the basement did. Hummed so that girls in his apartment building sometimes put their babies on top of the machines and let the vibrations lull them into sleep. The lights flickered for a second. The train started to slow and then sped up again, then slowed again. And black steel girders covered the years of oil and dirt became dimly visible outside the windows. Sergio looked up and over at the firemen who was sitting on the opposite side of the train, a bunch of seats farther down. The train jerked once more and then stopped altogether. The lights went out and the low emergency bulbs lit up. Everyone turned and looked out the windows at the blackness and waited. This was New York. It happened all the time. It could be 30 seconds. It could be 30 minutes. So this actually is a completely accurate description of what happens when a subway stops. Um, there are times when there's like maybe an emergency on the tracks, maybe another uh, subway car has had some kind of problem. And if you're on the same subway line behind that other train, you're stuck. And so if you've never had that experience, the train stops. And once the train stops, the emergency bulbs light up. So you've got some light, but it's so inconvenient. And it's so frustrating. And Sergio is not exaggerating. It could be 30 seconds or it could be 30 minutes. The longest I've ever been stuck on a subway was about 45 minutes and it was not happy. So, um, you know, Sergio doesn't really have a place to go. So this doesn't really seem like it'll be an issue for him, but it might be an issue for some of the other riders. Let's watch. After about five minutes, the grocery lady tipped her head back and started snoring. The businessman must have checked his watch at least a dozen times in the last minute and then finally let out a loud groan, but it didn't bring the train back to life. Sergio stretched out his legs. What difference did it make? He didn't have anywhere to go, though he wasn't thrilled about all this empty time to think. He didn't like thinking too hard except about math. Math had no feelings. It never let you down. Math made sense. People did not. Sergio deliberately made sure not to look toward where the fireman was sitting or make eye contact with him. No use inviting any more unwanted, friend, un, unwanted friendly conversation. So here, Sergio tells us he's not comfortable around people, okay? Math, he's great at because math is very logical and math never changes on you, correct? On a Monday, a Tuesday, a Thursday, it doesn't matter what mood you're in. Two plus three is always going to equal five. It does not matter what feelings are involved. People, people change. People are difficult. People are moody. People are unpredictable. And that is why Sergio prefers math to people. And even a friendly person like that firefighter is unwanted by Sergio right now because Sergio does not want to be talked out of his bad mood, his anger, his disappointment with his father. He wants to wallow in it a little bit. He wants to kind of, you know, roll around in his rage. And 
feel those feelings so that he can get it out of his system before he has to go home to his grandmother. So having somebody try and talk him into a better mood is not really what he's looking for right now. Another few minutes went by, snoring and time checking, checking time and snoring, but the train itself remained silent. I can't believe this. I just can't believe it. The white man suddenly said out loud. He stood up and walked over to the window on the other side of the train as if he might be able to see the problem from that angle. Can't be much longer, the fireman said. He recrossed his arms, modeling patience for the impatient man. Easy for you to say. The man sat back down. I have to get to work. Sergio looked up. What's that supposed to mean? They were all stuck on the train. Why did this guy think he was the only one with some place to go? Because he was white? Another minute passed and the man jumped up again. I can't take it. He headed for the door that led from one car into the next. He pulled on the handle, but it didn't open. The fireman stood. Sir, that's not a good idea. If the train suddenly starts moving, it's dangerous. You should probably stay seated. And who the hell are you? The man shot back. The tone of his voice was like a vault of electricity in Sergio's body. Unpleasant, familiar. Without being aware of it, Sergio tightened his hands into a fist. So there's a lot going on here, right? We see that this businessman is getting really, really impatient, right? And we see that the firefighter is trying to calm him down. Like, okay, it's all right, have a seat, wait, the train will start soon. When this man says, I have to get to work, Sergio takes that personally because he's looking at this guy as thinking he's more important than everyone else. That his impatience means that somehow this guy has this feeling of entitlement that he deserves a smooth train ride more than anybody else because he's important. Um, and that's not necessarily what's going on, but let's remember, Sergio's in a bad mood, so everything he encounters, he's gonna interpret negatively, okay? Um, and then we see that the fireman is being a little more uh, explicit with the man saying, if the train starts moving, it's dangerous for you to be standing up, right? And this man is not having it. And so he says something really nasty to, to the firefighter. And weirdly, Sergio says that the voice was like a volt of electricity. So there's that magic word like, and we have a comparison. Comparing a voice to electricity, we have a simile. And the idea that somehow this tone of voice is familiar. Who might... That kind of nasty, negative, entitled voice remind him of. If you guessed Paul, you'd be correct. Paul is negative, nasty, and entitled. Just like this man on the train. And for Sergio, it triggers something in him that he doesn't even realize, right? Without being aware of it, Sergio tightened his hands into fists because that, again, that anger towards Paul is bleeding into this situation. Let's keep going. What did his mother, his grandmother taught him? Stay out of fights. Stay away from men who fight. When you see a fight, turn, walk the other way. There was nowhere to go though. Nothing to do but sit and watch. Still his body. Stay alert. I work for the city of New York. Now will you kindly take your seat, sir? The fireman answered. The man yanked at the handle again. The city of New York. Well, that explains a lot. He pulled harder and suddenly the train lit up. Bells were dinging and the wheels screeched into motion, pitching the man forward. He hit his head hard on the door and slumped to the ground. Only then did the grocery woman wake up. Oh my God, that man is bleeding, she screamed. So here we see what the fireman had warned about actually happened. The train started, the businessman hit his head, and now he's bleeding, he's slumped onto the ground. 
right? Now, what's interesting about this is Sergio is expecting that somehow the firefighter is going to fight with this businessman. And really, that's not what the firefighter ends up doing at all. He instead tries to explain, I work for the city of New York. Take your seat. Be safe. And so it shows us that this firefighter is not like anybody else that Sergio has experience with. And so we'll have to wait until Sergio's next section to see how this plays out. Do you think the firefighter is going to help the businessman or do you think the businessman's just going to be left laying there bleeding? I'll bet you can guess what happens. Do me a favor, folks. Please go over to that character chart and please add these details under Sergio because uh, obviously it tells us a little bit more about Sergio's life and what's going on in his part of the story. And I'll see you next time for section nine.